What's going on, everybody, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you on Wednesday, December 20th, 2023. The holidays right around the corner. The hot stove still ongoing across Major League Baseball. And that video we made yesterday on the B-Shafe Daily podcast feed and the Brendan Schaefer St. Louis Cardinals writer YouTube channel, well, it's already a little bit outdated because of the news that the Padres are close to a deal for Yuki Matsui the left-handed Japanese reliever that we spent some time talking about on Tuesday. Still a great video to go back and check out, of course, but some of that information may be outdated now that it appears the Padres are closing in on a deal for Matsui. Now, this was the news as of like Tuesday afternoon, but I don't believe I have seen anything official in terms of Matsui and the Padres coming to terms on a deal. That seems to be the expectation, though. So that's the terms under which we'll operate for this episode of the show as we continue to talk about what the Cardinals could look to do. We are going to spend some time talking about another Japanese pitcher, the big one, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who is, of course, good pals with Lars Nootbaar. And last night, I was part of a fun little charity live stream by Newt News Podcast. The Newt News Podcast does a great job. You guys should follow them on all platforms, of course. Another good Cardinals podcast by uh, by some very smart Cardinals fans. But as a part of that, They had some various people on, myself included. Jim Hayes was one of those people who was a guest on the live stream yesterday, which was for charity for Big League Impact. And Jim Hayes talked about recording an interview with Lars Nupar, which this may be up on Jim's YouTube channel as of now. I'm not 100% sure if that's been released yet or if that's going to be released a little bit later in the week. But Jim Hayes, of course, I've talked about, has the YouTube channel that you guys should also check out. I'm just plugging everybody today. But Jim talking on the Newt News live stream last night on Tuesday night and said within the interview that he did of Lars Newtbar, Lars Newtbar seems to believe the Cardinals are not necessarily out on Yamamoto. The door is not closed there. And Jim said, I asked him point blank, do the Cardinals still have a chance? And Newt said yes. So we'll talk about that and what we think would have to happen really for the Cardinals and Yamamoto to take place. And then maybe what the likelihood is, not that we're uh, going to knock Lars Nupar as a source on this. I think he's probably uh, as plugged into Yamamoto's status as anybody, a good friend of his, of course, from their time at the World Baseball Classic together for Team Japan. But we'll get into a little bit of conversation on that, continue to circle the wagons as the baseball world waits to see where Yamamoto will land and, of course, the price point at which he will land, the number, the contract, seemingly going up more and more by the day with the handful plus number of teams that we know to have been involved. Uh, The big name teams like the Yankees and the Dodgers probably still considered the front runners, but where do the Cardinals land in this sweepstakes? We'll kind of react to what we heard from the cat yesterday on that Newt News live stream and discuss any other Cardinals things we feel relevant as, uh, as I often do just kind of a stream of consciousness here on B shape daily. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. If you enjoy Cardinals content all year long, That's what we're bringing you here on the channel. Also, over on Spotify and Apple Podcasts is where you can find the audio version of this podcast. I've been putting the videos on Spotify as well. If you guys are Spotify listeners out there, are you seeing videos? Are you just seeing audio? I'm kind of curious what it is like from the listener point of view. I I can see what it looks like on my end, and I think the videos are posting, which is something new. It won't always be that way. Some nights I'll have to just do an audio podcast, but I'm going to try to do more videos moving forward when I can. Let me know if you like that better, if you dislike it, if you're on YouTube, if you like it, if you dislike it, those sorts of things. But we'll continue to try and tinker with the format of B-Shape Daily as we go along. I also, before we get started, wanted to do one more plug. Yeah, it's the day of plugs on B-Shape Daily. I'm going to throw this up on the screen right now. If you're watching the video version, you see it. STL, or I should rephrase, St. Louis, BBWAA.com is where you should go. Yes, you, if you're a Cardinals fan, should go and purchase tickets to this year's Baseball Writers Dinner in St. Louis at the MAC in downtown St. Louis. It's going to be a great time. I got to attend my first dinner uh, as a member of the chapter last year because there were a few years there where we didn't do the dinner with COVID and what have you. The dinner's back. The dinner's better than ever. A ton of names that you know as a Cardinal fan will be in attendance at this dinner, will potentially be speaking at this dinner, will be honored at this dinner, Names like Tony La Russa, names like Adam Wainwright, uh, lots and lots more from maybe some guys from previous Cardinals teams. It's a 20th anniversary of a certain Cardinals uh, pennant team. So a lot going on at this dinner. It's a mid-January dinner the same weekend, the Sunday night of the winter warm-up. 
in St. Louis. So just wanted to bring this up real quick. Uh, this is a huge fundraising event that we hold for the St. Louis Baseball Writers Chapter every year. So if you're interested, it's a nice dinner. It was a, a steak dinner last year. I think we're doing something similar this year. So good food, uh, good entertainment in terms of the, the number of folks from Cardinals lore that you'll get a chance to see on the stage and hear from at this event. So it's a really fun time. Again, it's the Sunday night of winter warm-up in St. Louis. So if you're planning to go to that anyway, this is an excellent opportunity, holiday gift for uh, your your friends, your family, whomever that's a Cardinal fan in your life, something to definitely check out. St. Louis BBWA.com is the link to purchase tickets to that. And there's also going to be a, a VIP meet and greet sort of thing, um, or it's like a Q&A session. And I believe it has been confirmed one of the people that's going to be attending that, but I'm not, I don't know if we put this out there yet, but he's definitely somebody you're going to want to hear from. And we're thinking there will be another uh, guest as a part of that as well. So the VIP tickets are going to be really cool too. So check that out, stlouisbbwa.com. Pause the screen. Just You can pause the screen and, and take down that URL if you're interested. Okay, normally don't plug a bunch of stuff on the show, but that is a fundraising thing and something that we're working really hard on behind the scenes to make happen. So I uh, wanted to get that out of the way. Thank you guys for indulging me there. Yamamoto. <laughs> Let's get into it. What do we think the chances are for Yoshinobu Yamamoto to become a St. Louis Cardinal? I would say, and this is something we talked about last night on that new news live stream. Um, I hopped on with the guys about two and a half hours into the thing, I think, around 8.30. So if you'd like to catch my segment, uh, I'm sure that's live on their YouTube channel. You can go back and look at it. But we were talking about the notion that when all of this began and you thought about what Yamamoto could command in terms of a contract coming over from Japan, great pitcher over there, in his prime, he's like 25 years old, uh, 150, 180, maybe 200 million, right? Would be the, the big massive contract to say, wow, that's it. including the posting fee, everything that goes into that. That would be certainly a, a price point. Could the Cardinals afford it? Yeah, they probably could over, you know, six, seven, eight years, whatever that might end up being. Yeah, they probably could. That seemed to be the dominant mindset. Would they do it? Well, it's obviously a bigger deal than they've ever done before with a free agent that had not played for the team. Uh, with Wilson Contreras' deal last offseason being still the largest at $87.5 million for a free agent player that was not previously a Cardinal. That distinction is put in there because of Matt Holliday, who technically was brought back as a free agent, but he had already played uh, for the Birds on the bat. But now we're hearing about Yamamoto. Could it be 250 275 300 million, maybe even more? I'm seeing some crazy numbers, and it's all speculation because I don't know that Anybody really has firmly put out the data that you would trust to say this was an offer that was on the table. That all could be coming uh, in the days ahead. And maybe this is something that gets re resolved before the Christmas holiday. We'll see how long it ends up dragging on. But the the general consensus seems to be that Yamamoto is going to get a bag. And we already knew that, but a bag even maybe larger than we could have envisioned previously. And it's interesting why this is happening because a number of teams are in competition for him. And a lot of the teams that we're hearing about are those big market teams that presumably have a lot of money to spend. And this is a unique player in the market. This is a guy that, you know, you're probably not going to find a way to replicate necessarily in terms of his age as a free agent at 25 years old and the ACE level potential that he, that he has. Uh, and not to mention, you don't have to give up a draft pick, a, a second round draft pick to sign him because he's, there is no qualifying offer. He's an international free agent. Uh, but he is through the posting system, you know, tethered to that to where the team that signs him is going to have to spend a lot of extra money uh, to, to pay to his former team over in Japan. Looking at some different articles here, there's a, a CBS article. Let me see. Uh, Mike Axisa, I may be saying his name wrong, but he wrote an article talking about the seven teams that are known to be involved in the Yamamoto sweepstakes. And he ranked them by the, you know, who can ill afford to, to lose out on this guy. And it seems like the Blue Jays, the Phillies, we know the Dodgers are going to be involved. The Yankees, of course, are going to be involved. The Red Sox were rumored to have been involved, but we haven't, uh, according to the reporting that I have read over the last couple of days, didn't necessarily meet with him over the, the recent days that we thought maybe a meeting would take place. So does that spell, I think Chris Cotillo had that. Uh, so that's bad news if you're a Red Sox fan. The Giants, are they really in the mix? And then there's the Mets, obviously, with Steve Cohen trying to, you know, always always bag those big money free agents. Those are like the teams that are being considered uh, supposedly by Yamamoto. The Cardinals not found on that list, right? And so does that mean they're not in on Yamamoto at all? 
I mean, it would stand to reason that they wouldn't be at these prices if we're really talking about a $300 million contract. However, and I keep coming back to the the Jim Hayes uh, conversation with Lars Newbar, which, again, wait to see what was actually said in that. But Jim's not the type to just make things up for for clout or anything like that. He's saying it because it was part of the the interview that you'll be able to see on his YouTube channel coming up. But he says, like, no, if Yamamoto is is in play, Lars Newbar says Yamamoto's still in play, the Cardinals still have a chance, then, you know, I think you take him at his word that that's the case. Granted, Lars Newbar's not in the front office, but uh, Lars Newbar probably wouldn't necessarily be wasting a lot of his time trying to push his buddy Yamamoto to maybe consider St. Louis if there wasn't at least an inkling that that would be a possibility. Another interesting tidbit that, again, I can't wait to see in the the, the interview with Jim was Newbar mentioning that, well, his mom and, and Yamamoto's mom have gotten rather close through the World Baseball Classic process, and she's trying to push Yamamoto's mom to say, hey, consider St. Louis. You know, our, our boys can be on the, the same team together. The initial kind of reporting about Yamamoto was that, well, he wants to play on a team with another Japanese teammate, which, you know, there are a number of those guys across Major League Baseball, but you would initially go, oh, well, does that does that mean the Cardinals wouldn't be involved? Absolutely not. I Lars Dupar counts. <laughs> I mean, he absolutely counts, given that there's been a friendship sparked up there. Um, I'm sure Yamamoto would love to play with Lars Newbar. I don't have any doubt about that. Those guys they clearly hit it off. They've played golf together. They've been hanging out. That being said, at the end of the day, this is that once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for uh, a guy like Yamamoto to take the biggest of bites out of the MLB free agency Apple in a way that, you know, you sign a multi-year contract, whether it's five years, six years, eight years, whatever it is, that you know, you'll be 32, 33 the next time this comes about. This is your moment to really maximize uh, life-changing money for a for a, a baseball player. And he is the the center of the baseball universe now that, that Shohei Otani has signed with the Dodgers. Another reason that you would think, well, Dodgers probably would have a nice in there with uh, not only just another Japanese teammate, but the Japanese teammate, the most famous player in all of baseball at this point, Shohei Otani. So for the Cardinals, does it just come down to a willingness to spend the money and make that work out? Yeah, I think it would. Would the Cardinals have to be the highest bidder? Maybe not. I mean, it's hard to imagine when you start to creep up in terms of the expectations for the salary that a guy wouldn't go to the highest bidder when we're uh, talking about 280, 300, maybe more than $300 million for a contract. But by the same token, if you're already getting $300 million, What's the difference between 310, 320, 325, 290? Like, at that point, you want to go to the best situation for yourself. And I think that Yamamoto, you know, wants to win, wants to compete, wants to go to a contender. Is there an element of this where you're not going to be able to beat your geography that continues to be a topic that comes up? Like, let's say the Cardinals are willing to spend the money. Is geography going to be a problem for them? Because a lot of these guys that come over, they're looking for... and. I couldn't blame them. They're looking for the best geographic places to live in terms of things like weather. You know, if I, St. Louis is great. Um, I lived in Texas for a while, central Texas. I like the weather better there, like by a lot. And so if you could bring that weather to me in St. Louis, I'd have it made. But otherwise, there's always going to be that pull of like, man, wouldn't it be great if we still lived in a place where our, our face didn't freeze off every winter? If I'm... Yamamoto and I've got this once in a lifetime opportunity and I have all these suitors. I'm going to be a little bit picky and choosy with the the city that I go to, that I make my new life in, my new home in. Places like Los Angeles, um San Diego, obviously if they were in a position to spend as much money this offseason, which I don't think they are, given the, you know, unfortunate death of their their principal owner and everything that's going on there, we're seeing the Padres shed money more than anything, so not super clear, but like You're thinking about those things and maybe, you know, not just in terms of weather, but like big city atmosphere, New York, Chicago. uh, We mentioned Los Angeles. Like those are probably factors as well for these guys coming over. Everybody's going to have their own different things that they prioritize and that they care about the most. Who knows, you know, who's to say what that is for Yamamoto. But the Cardinals, to even be in the conversation, would have to be willing to pony up the cash. It would have to be a comparable contract, even if they're not the highest bidder, they would have to be willing to enter into a stratosphere that they simply have never involved themselves in outside of, I mean, even when you talk about David Price and that pursuit a number of years ago, when he ended up going to the Red Sox at the final moment, 
Uh, what was that contract? Like $180 million? The, the Cardinals did have a willingness to take on Giancarlo Stanton, which was another, you know, $200 million or whatever that deal would have been at the time when his trade happened from Miami to the New York Yankees. It's like the Cardinals have had a willingness in the past, but what's their payroll situation this time around? We know that they are, they have said they're, you know, they're not going to expand to the extent that they would be in danger with the luxury tax and have to pay a tax penalty. Uh, and, and you might say, well, they said they'd go up to 200 million. The luxury tax is 230 million. I am not the payroll expert to be able to, to dive into the weeds on exactly where it would put them to add a contract like Yamamoto. I'm pretty sure though, it would be above the luxury tax because it's not just the the payroll number there are a lot of other considerations and it's not just the 26 man roster it's 40 man roster and all these other things that get baked into that luxury tax number um it, it may not be the exact number that they're allocating this year because like we see with the Dodgers they're paying Shohei Otani 2 million dollars a year for 10 years like that's going to be the contract and then 68 million thereafter for the next decade um starting in like 2034 but that doesn't mean that 2 million is what they're being charged on for the luxury tax purposes, it's like 46 million or something per year. So it's a, a certainly a decrease to the penalty, but I don't know how much all of the, I don't know the ins and outs of why it's 46 million or what it is. That's just, maybe it's something that I could figure out, but I'm trying to do minimal math after high school. So uh, my point with all of that being, I, I don't know exactly where it would put the Cardinals, but I think Yamamoto for it to happen, you you would probably have to shed payroll and realize that, by trading, like, the name that would come up is clearly, okay, Steven Matz has $11 million per year for the next couple of years. That's what remains on his contract. Trade that money away, and that frees up $11 million per year. And if you're paying Yamamoto $30 million per year, now it's only really, like, 19 and that can probably fit within the confines because they're at about 180 or whatever they're at. And that keeps you under 200. Like, I'm, I'm giving some rough numbers, but let's say it's neat and tidy and works out that way. It doesn't work out that way for infinity it works out that way for 2024 maybe 2025 but then beyond that Sonny gray you start to have to pay him more and his luxury tax penalty is more than what they're going to be paying him in 2024 which i think it's like a 10 million dollar and then it's an escalator escalator uh to where the third year of the deal for gray ends up being like well beyond 30 million like 35 million or something like that so for the cardinals it's it's not like forever you end up not having to to worry about deferred money like all of that sort of is going to hit at the same time in terms of that gray contract. And so whatever your payroll for 2024 would be, it's different for 2025 and 26, regardless of if you make other moves. And a Yamamoto contract is going to be at least six years. And I would have to guess more like seven or eight years. And then there are considerations down the road that you just would have to make mind of knowing what else you have on the books. And it's not to say that the Cardinals couldn't massage the numbers to make that work but I would have a difficult time imagining them doing it without trading away somebody like a Steven Matz. And really he's the only candidate because I don't think Miles Michael is with the very freshly signed contract has trade value. Um, you, you know, even with Steven Matz, you're going to have to probably eat some of that money. So you don't gain the entire benefit of moving his money. If you were to make that type of deal. And then the other three guys you just signed like that just happened this off season. So you're not trading those players. So Steven Matz is really the only answer, and I don't know what the market for him would necessarily be. So when we've heard the word from John Mozeliak before, the word being complicated, I would say that, yeah, this would be an example of something that would be complicated for the Cardinals to potentially be able to pull off. It is very compelling. It is interesting for sure that Lars Newbar is telling Jim Hayes, hey, I don't think they're out of it, but we would have to step back in and look at the logistics of, well, would it make sense for the Cardinals to choose this to be the moment that they go above and beyond anything they've ever done for a player? Um, clearly, they've been scouting him, and they like him, and they they would love to have Yamamoto, but how far are you willing to stretch with all the uncertainty that's going on? Because, like, there is an easy ace in the hole if you're the Cardinals, if you're the organization here, uh, and even if you wanted to do something like this, and maybe you would have considered it at $175 million or $200 million, but now that the, the word is out that maybe it's going to be a uh, heck of a lot more than that, which is just crazy the way that it has evolved in recent weeks. I think it just is the, the competition for a unique player, um, knowing that if you don't get this guy, there's not something else out there that's going to be like him. Sure, you could sign Blake Snell, but that's a guy who's a little bit older, a little bit more of an injury history, you know, whatever the price point's going to be. Like, it's just there is there is one Yamamoto left in this market, and all of the best teams with the most 
payroll flexibility or willingness to just say, screw the payroll, we're going to do it, those teams are all going to be in the mix for this guy. And so that's what just makes it difficult. The Cardinals have found a way. Like The Cardinals have picked up key players before. They picked up guys with contracts before. They picked up talented guys before. But what is the formula typically for that? All right. Let's look at this offseason. The big spend expenditure was Sonny Gray. What's the story there? He wanted to be a Cardinal, and he's a little bit older. So the teams that are really in on an ace maybe weren't looking his direction because they're thinking more long-term. We're going to sign a guy to a five- or six-year deal like a Yamamoto or a Blake Snell or maybe even a Jordan Montgomery who's a little bit younger than Sonny Gray. Sonny Gray pitched like an ace last year. The Cardinals are very bottom line about this, and they say we need a guy who can pitch like that this year so we can improve upon the 71-91 and 91 record that we just had. And he wants to be in St. Louis, wants to be a Cardinal, and fits the clubhouse culture. Like, all of those things. The, the, a lot of fans, I feel like, view it as, oh, the Cardinals settled for, you know, the the cheaper star player. You know, they cheaped out by going Sonny Gray. Rather than, wow, they made the commitment to, uh, you know, a guy for $25 million a year, whatever the Gray numbers are. Like, it, it's viewed as like, oh, they cheaped out because they went with the, the very Cardinals – older guy that's going to be less risky if he does happen to flame out like all those things and that's true but also the cardinals from their perspective are probably like give us a little credit we're we're spending the money that like, we're spending on guys that we know we can get whereas if you let it drag out and you think we want to make a play for yamamoto and we're going to offer which i don't think the cardinals have probably made an offer on yamamoto it doesn't seem like that's imminent if it happens and it's the cardinals it's going to be under the cover of darkness it's going to be at the last moment, and it's going to be something that nobody sees coming. That would be my expectation. I did give the guys on Newt News last night, they asked me like a percentage. I said, it's lower than 10, and they were like, well, 10's pretty good. I said, no, no, lower than 10. Everybody calm down, but I said like 7%, and I think even that was probably too high, but that's just the number that I threw out in the moment because there's always that possibility that the Cardinals say, hey, enough is enough, and we see the pieces that are coming together, and this is what fans want them to do. Fans want them to say, we see the pieces, we see the opportunity in the window here with still a prime Arenado, a prime Goldschmidt, um, the, the guys that, we, that we've that we added in the rotation, like you're the Cardinals looking at this, that's why I say we. And you look at the young guys in the, the position player group and the guys that are somewhat cost-controlled but have also been proven to be legit contributors and you have across the diamond players that can, you know, put this offense into like a top five to top 10 position. It's going to have to be there based on the way they're building out the pitching staff. But all those things would kind of come together to suggest that maybe the Cardinals could see that this is a moment in time where they could forget all of the, you know, treading carefully and and just take a risk that fans are going to appreciate and that's going to pay off, certainly would pay off in terms of, like, international endorsements and things like that. Like, a lot of the word on the Otani stuff is, like, sure, the Dodgers, it's $700 million. It's a huge number. How do they even lose out on that with all that they are probably going to be adding in terms of like corporate sponsorships and business opportunities and partnership opportunities that I feel like are going to exist because you are you are really cementing yourself with an entire new clientele, a new group of, of advertisers that could potentially get on board and globalize your brand, which is not to say that the Dodgers weren't already a huge brand in, in baseball and in sports. But Otani has that magnetism about him that I think is going to bring that to the table. Yamamoto would absolutely have that for uh, uh, an organization like the St. Louis Cardinals. I don't think there's any doubt about it that that would be a contract that, sure, it's a big number. But if you've got the right people in charge business-wise, making it make sense and making it work for you, uh, the, the the fan bases that you open yourself up to, you know, you wouldn't be the national team of Japan. You'd probably have to get... Otani and Yamamoto to have done that, which maybe the Dodgers will do. But you're telling me like there aren't going to be opportunities with Newt Bar and Yamamoto on the same team. Like that would be something that you open yourself up to that I think should be considered. I'm sure that in, you know, casually the Cardinals are probably thinking behind closed doors, like, yep, that is an interesting concept, but is it enough to like rally around and actually make an, a, a franchise altering decision to put you know, to back this horse, this has to be the right horse if you're spending that kind of money on him. So, like, those are the questions that I think the Cardinals would have to be considering right now if they're going to be involved in this pursuit. But I could understand the fan base looking at it from the standpoint of this is the moment, if you were ever going to do it, this is the guy to do it for. 
and letting the chips fall where they may because it's a very impulsive kind of feeling. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think that there's a, a certainly an argument to be made that the Cardinals should be doing everything in their power to make this happen, even with the moves that they've made so far. But with the, the C word, complicated, to do that and then to say to make it happen, we'd have to make a trade. What if you're stuck with you know more salary than you thought? And, and, and it puts you in a bind with all of the Bally Sports things that are that are going on. Um, that's That's part of that uncertainty that I was trying to get into a little bit ago in the video. Like all of these things, I think, are a consideration for the Cardinals that make it more of a thought process, more involved than just the fan perspective of, oh, just do it. This is the moment to do it, and and, and you should, right? So, I like, for the Cardinals, Sonny Gray, that was a big expenditure, and I think it, it's painting Sonny Gray in the wrong light to say, oh, of course, they signed a very Cardinals type of star player. They they didn't just get the big fish. Yeah, there's. I think there is just a way that the Cardinals – feel they have to operate within the confines of what their geography is and, and what their their blueprint to building a winning team is. And so they, they probably have some hesitancy to jump into, to wade this deep into the pool that would be a $300 million contract for a pitcher, which always is accustomed to injury more so than position players, and a pitcher that's never pitched in MLB. I don't think that's as much of a factor uh, because I think everybody – is universally accepting that Yamamoto is going to be a stud and his game's going to translate. But that being said, like it would, we'd be remiss if we didn't at least acknowledge the fact of like, that's probably a risk back in somebody, the, the deep confines of somebody's minds of what if he isn't as good as we think. Right. So like, those are all considerations. I I'm painting both sides. I'm, I'm giving you kind of the, the context of, I think the way the team would have to look at these things. If you ask my opinion, yeah, the Cardinals should be willing to to make an offer. Here's the thing. You make him say no. You make him take somebody else's offer. This idea of you've got to have the perfect stars aligned to even submit an offer because you're worried about somebody saying no or you're worried about, well, he doesn't want to play here. Yes, all those things are true. If you want to say, well, the player has to want to be here. That's why Sonny Gray worked. That's why Lance Lynn worked. That's why Kyle Gibson worked. Totally understand that. It's not illegal to make an offer to a player that you don't know that well. And I feel like the Cardinals do know him that well because they've scouted him and they have a, a pretty good idea of what he's about. And, and, and Lars Nupar would be right there to, to answer any questions that they would need about him personally, right? So it's okay if you're the Cardinals. And I, this shouldn't be like groundbreaking, but I feel like for the Cardinals, the way they operate is like they're, they don't want to be told no in a pursuit. I think it's like a mental hurdle. This is just my speculation. If I'm wrong... John Mozilla can say, you know, this guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Usually I don't, right? When we're speculating, we're not always going to have the the full information of what's going on behind closed doors. But for YouTube video, that's kind of the purposes of, of I think, what Cardinals fans want to hear about. But it's like, if there was a moment where they said, you know what, we are we going to do $300 million? No. But there's nothing against the law to say that we can't offer 8 and 240 If, you know, even if that's not going to be the highest offer, that will at least be something, you know, you give him something to consider because you do have certain things that other teams don't have. They might have geography. They might have, you know, uh, the, the the big city lifestyle, whatever might be attractive to Yamamoto. But the Cardinals do have Lars Newbar, and so, like, that is a, a personal connection. I am not saying that Lars Newbar, his presence alone, can make up a, a $60 million or an $80 million gap in contract offers. But why not just send an offer, right? However that works, you tell the agent, hey, here's what we're offering. That's on the table. Um, it'll be on the table until Friday. If if not, you know, that's our best and final. That's what we can do. We appreciate your consideration throughout this process. Done. I don't think there's any harm in that at all. Maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree. Maybe I'm crazy. Let me know in the comment section below what your thought process is. As a Cardinal fan, like, what would you like to see the Cardinals do? You know, we're, we're talking about things that go on behind closed doors, and so we have to understand as, as outsiders – that are not people in the front office or we're not baseball agents. We don't necessarily know how the sausage is made every time we get, you know, reports come out about the after facts of it. You know, uh, Moselock talked to Katie Wu and, and she wrote a story about how the Sunny Gray deal came together. Like sometimes we find out some of that information, but if you're the Cardinals, I don't think there's any harm in, in making that kind of offer, right? It, whatever you're comfortable with. Now, if you think, well, we're not willing to go beyond 190 and we're here and he's going to get 300 million. Yeah, then maybe you're probably wasting your time. But if you can put yourself in the ballpark, might be worth sending the offer. Making him say no is something that I feel like the Cardinals 
And, like, you're not sending that offer hoping he says no so that you can at least go back to your fan base or leak it and say, hey, we tried. Like, we this was the offer. We, we made an attempt. Thank goodness he didn't accept it because we didn't. Re- no, like, if you're if you're in on this player and you truly would want him to be on your team, but you just are like, I don't know if we're going to outbid everybody, be the first or one of the early teams to to throw the offer and the number down on the table. Why not, right? Because with Yuki Matsui reportedly going to the Padres, all the stories that I'm looking up as of right now, like I just Googled his name to see, all the most recent stories are they're close to a deal. Okay, I guess that means it's coming. If not, and I'm the Cardinals and I want Yuki Matsui still, if there's no official announcement, and I'm John Mozeliak, I mean, he visited St. Louis. Mark Feinstein reported that he was in town at, at Bush, I presume. If that's the case and you're seeing that he's signing with the Padres potentially, maybe that's all being reported to get the Cardinals to up the offer, whatever. Do what you're comfortable with and send that offer, right? Like, he visited you. Did the Cardinals make a formal formal offer on that visit? I have no idea. It would be great to find out. And if, if that information should come out, the Cardinals are notoriously, they don't they don't leak that, that type of information out, right? They They keep a pretty tight ship and they do that because it's that the way they want to operate. It's the way they've always done it. But if there's nothing official for Matsui and you think, hey, this is a lefty reliever that can help us at the back end, just pair him a dynamite arm with, with Jojo Romero, then go send that offer and, and make sure the agent knows, like, hey, I've heard, you know, we, we've all seen the news. San Diego looks like you guys are close there. What, what does it take? What do we need to do? Or here's the offer that we're prepared to send. Let us know if that's something that, is workable or if we're not, you know, if we're not in the ballpark, just negotiate, like make it happen. It sounds like super simple. And I know it, it's probably ridiculous because I'm sure negotiating is exactly what they're doing. They've got a process, but if you've got guys that like, if you're interested enough in the player to get him to Bush, I don't, I don't see what would be left other than to make that happen, make the final offer, make the, make the money work out again, He's visited other places, and so he might choose somebody else. If I could live, all else being equal, in San Diego versus St. Louis, yeah, I'm, you know, San Diego. There's a lot of there's a lot of appeal to that, but I think it's you know it's interesting that we're seeing. Well, they're close to a deal. Sources say they're close to a deal. Is it done? Maybe the Cardinals jump in there, or maybe they go a different direction, as we talked about yesterday. Go back on your your feed, and, and you can check out the video that we talked about Dylan Cease and other potential options as to whether the Cardinals have closed the door on a starter. I don't know if they've closed the door on the starter. It seems that they haven't. Um, a starter of Yamamoto's caliber and more importantly of his salary may not be in the cards, but if you ask Lars Newpar per Jim Hayes, maybe it's not over until it's over. Um, definitely be on the lookout for that from Jim's YouTube channel. Let me know what you think about all of this, this the concept of Yamamoto and whether it's it's gotten to the point of barking up a wrong tree, or if maybe you think there could be still some smoke there and the Cardinals are just operating in the shadows, um, waiting for their moment, biding their time to sl- give everybody the slip and sign him at the, the 11th hour. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Appreciate you guys, as always, for listening. One more time, I'll remind you about S- uh, stlouisbbwaa.com. It's a link to the dinner tickets, Tony LaRusso, Adam Wainwright, and more. Go to stlouisbbwaa.com to check that out. Appreciate you guys, as always, for watching and listening on B-Shape Daily. One more request to subscribe in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. But until next time, that'll do it for this edition of the show. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.